This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at St. Barnabas Episcopal Church, Deland, Florida, June 30th, 2013. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the promise of your presence that when we gather together in the name of your Son, that you are here. Open our hearts and our minds to his presence. Draw us near to you. Work in us that which you desire. Thank you that we are yours. And so we say, speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's really terrific to be with you this morning. Actually, I was here, but it was a very long time ago. In fact, uh, David Sula was the rector back then, so that dates me considerably. But I've done this, my wife and I, our family, have done this sort of circuitous route from Central Florida, where I, in essence, got started, married, all our kids were born here, and then we went from there to Pittsburgh, to Philadelphia, to New York City, and now back down to Central Florida again. So it's great to be, in essence, home. And so it's terrific to be with you. Um, because of my experience of St. Barnabas, again, a long time ago, but the great respect I had for your former rector and the fact that I like your new rector, too, um, <laughs> I, I, I really wanted to do something in some ways that I wanted to be prepared. But I must confess to you that I had a really hard time. You know, sometimes I can look at all the lessons and it's just everything lines up. Oh, that's what should be said. Bad. Do the research, get the sermon together, do all the prep, say my prayers, ready. Sometimes I look at the scriptures and as I said to Laura Lane, I've got nothing. Um, there, it was as if there was this wall inside. But, you know, I don't know whether this is true for you or not. Sir, true for me. That if there's a wall inside to what the scriptures are saying, the first thing I need to do is deal with the wall. In other words, there's something inside of me that's resistant. And so what I had to do was go back and look at the scriptures as it were again and again and reread them and go to the commentaries and reread them again. And finally, it was like it, it broke through. And, and here's what began to happen. I understood that the thing that holds all three of these lessons, the story of Elijah and Elisha, the story of what Paul is happened, saying to the church in Galatia, and the story in Luke, what binds all those three together has to do with the issue of commitment. And pretty uncompromising commitment at that. And that was in fact the law. You see, The uncompromising nature of what it means to be committed to Jesus always hits the wall of, I want to live my life the way I want to live it. And that's really what the scripture is getting at, at, the, at its heart. You see, I think what's true for most of us is that what we want is that we want to come to church and we want to hear the, the good parts. The words about God's mercy and his forgiveness and a place of heaven when we die and the fact that we belong to him. And all of that's true. I mean, absolutely all of that without hesitation or condition is completely and totally true. But the way we in somehow filter that is that we want those things in our lives so that we can be, so that I can be a better me. And so that I can fulfill my responsibilities as a, as a husband and as a father, my community, my friends, uh, do a better job of what it is that I'm doing, uh, be thought of well as a citizen, as a bishop. In other words, and, but the scriptures don't start there at all. The priority that we have in our lives toward what is sort of popularly known as self-fulfillment is really not a priority in the scriptures. It is, the scriptures by contrast are, what's our term for it? They're very countercultural, as it applies to 
the way we feel so absorbed, and honestly so, it's the, the soup we live in around me trying to do what I want to get what I want when I want it, even though we can do that in a very nice way. And, and so what Jesus, what all three scriptures are about is that they kind of come at that head on. And it starts with the Elijah Elisha story. If you've been in church for a while, you may have read some of this in the past. I mean, God has spoken to Elijah, and he basically says, okay, I want you to, in essence, anoint, publicly recognize, that's what that means, uh, a new regime, you know, a new, a new king, new head of the army, priest, someone, and a new prophet. And what we get is the story of Elijah and the new prophet, Elisha, confusing, Elijah, Elisha. And so what the scripture reading tells us this morning, and it's very sort of not how we would do things, is that Elijah goes and he finds Elisha. And what's Elisha doing? He's, wow, the man's a farmer. And a pretty prosperous farmer at that because he has 12 yoke of oxen. That's a lot of property in that day. And so what Elijah does is that he takes his cloak and he sort of throws it over his shoulder and just keeps on walking. It's, it's not how we do things. Have you ever been recruited for the vestry in a way like that? I don't know anything like that. I mean, usually what we want to do is flatter. Here are the skills that you have. This is why we need you in our community or in this position. You would be great for the job. And if we're Christian, we'll say, and I've really been praying about it too. Um, and, but Elijah does none of those things. No. He literally throws the cloak around his shoulder and just keeps on walking. In other words, it's up to you. You can say yes to this or no. Uh, to use the vernacular, no skin off my nose. And he just keeps on walking. Elisha recognizes immediately precisely what has happened. Elijah the prophet has said, you're the next prophet. Do you want it or don't you? And so he goes running to Elijah and says, because he knows he's about to walk away from everything. First, let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye. We would say, of course you should do that. Honor your parents, right? Elijah says, what did I do to you? In other words, are you sure you really want this? I mean, it's like he doesn't care. It's like he knows God says he's the man, and that's all his job was to do, was to, in essence, make the symbolic gesture, throw the cloak over his shoulder. And what's the subtext of this, and it parallels the gospel reading, is it, he's not just going back to his mom and dad and saying, goodbye, I'll see you. If he would have, particularly in that place of prosperity, 12 yoke of oxen, there would have been parties, not just party. It would have lasted for days. There would have been long celebrations as the sun was going away. And Elijah, see, would have none of that. It's like, come on, let's go. And so what does Elisha do? He responds. He literally kills all 12 yoke of oxen, breaks down the plow. The plow becomes a barbecue, cooks all of the meat, serves probably in that culture. How many people were a part of the estate? Hundreds, more than likely. And they all ate, and then he walked away. In other words, what he did was literally destroy his old livelihood. In other words, what he's saying to Elijah is that there is no plan B. I'm not, I, I can't say later, well, I guess I'll go back to farming. He had a very clear symbolic and public act is saying to the entire community, I am done with my old way of life. I am going to follow Elijah, and no matter what, and no matter what happens. In, in a sense, what is being acted out is exactly the same thing that Jesus asked the rich young ruler, as we call him, when he came to Jesus and he wants to follow Jesus, and what does Jesus say? Good, sell all that you have, give it away to the poor, and come follow me. See, that's exactly, in essence, what Elisha did in this story. Rich young ruler couldn't do it. Elisha did. And so, what does that leave us with? Does that leave us with the sense that um, it really is up to us, and we've been called by God, and it could cost us everything? Ooh, see, now that gets at 
Oh, but I, I don't want it to cost me everything. I didn't sign up for that. I just want to be better. I want to be forgiven. But I don't want to quit my job. It's so countercultural to the way we think, isn't it? And, and you see, in the Galatian lesson, it actually doesn't get any better. Because in the Galatian lesson, as was correctly said in terms of the precede of the lesson, that this is about the nature of freedom. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. But it's not how you and I think about freedom. The, the lesson begins, that section, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Don't get tangled again in the yoke of bondage. Well, what does freedom mean? For most of us, freedom means free to do whatever I want to do. We filter it through the, what's my right as an American citizen? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The freedom to, in essence, fulfill my dreams, to rise up and do whatever I want to do. And as a country, that's a very good, that's a very good opportunity for its citizens. But that's not what Paul is talking about when he talks about freedom. And he goes on to explain it. He says, what is this freedom for? It is, in fact, not to do what you want. He's very clear. He says that verbatim. Instead, this freedom is the freedom to love one another as slaves. Ooh. Because see, what does a slave do? A slave basically, a slave's time is, in fact, determined by the needs of other people. A slave doesn't have the opportunity to say no. That's why we abhor it as a social institution, and rightly so. But it is, in fact, an accurate description of our relationship to Jesus. We are his servants. And as Paul rightly connects, because Jesus says, if you've done it under the least of these, my brothers, you've done it under me. The same call is to serve and to care for other people. Well, you see, I don't want that. I want to be able to give. I, I'd actually like to be known as a generous person. But, but I want to do that on my terms. I want to take care of me, and then if I have any money left over, I want to be able to give it away. I, I want to fulfill my obligations and responsibilities and the list that I have. I, I don't know about what your life is like, but I literally walk into every workday with a list of things that I'm supposed to do. Emails to answer, phone calls to make, people I need to connect to. Uh, that's my life. And what Paul is saying is, no, actually real love is not getting your list done. Real love is making room for inconveniences. Well, if, if I want to be in charge of my life, I don't want inconveniences. Right? Not your head. Bring this one together. <laughs> I, I, I want things to go according to my schedule. I want to get there. I want things to go on time, and I want to get it done. So when, when a phone call shows up, and all of a sudden, bang, I've got an emergency or things like that, sometimes, not always, thank God, but sometimes, there's this irritation that comes up in me. It's like, oh, why now? <laughs> right? I understand, because we're together in this one. And, and, but you see, that's not what, what Paul is talking about. What Paul is talking about is that God is working a level of freedom in our lives that actually sets us free to rise up in the inconvenient moment and not complain to God about it or to somebody else. And then, in the Gospel reading, it gets worse. Because... He's calling people to come and follow him, and they have all of these things that we would think of is actually very responsible things to do to your family and to those whom you know and love. And Jesus is like, do you really want it on your terms? Guess what? Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In other words, if you want to follow me, it's going to cost you. And then the kicker, the last line of the Gospel reading, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, at that point, let's just go home. <laughs> I mean, even if you go back to the Galatian lesson, and Paul lays out this really way too pointed contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Well, you know, if we're actually really honest, 
And we go through the works of the flesh, uh, that, and people who do these things aren't fit for the kingdom. Well, there, it's that awful phrase again. Um, well, you know, I, I do those things, don't you? I mean, if you actually pay any, list, any attention to those and tease them out a little bit, sure, they, they may not be all the time, but are they uh, occasional? Mm, yes, they are. And so where does that leave us? Well, there is good news in the readings, but you have to sort of mine it. It's not evident. And it has everything to do with the whole point of these lessons are meant, in fact, to really drive us to Jesus, to face the real truth of what is, in fact, inside of us, that we are, in fact, divide, we have divided hearts, we're more than happy to be nice on our terms. That generosity has everything to do with what we have left over. And that we want to be kind to people, certainly. But, but there is about even that kindness sometimes a kind of manipulation that allows us, you know, if I, I, I build a relationship with someone, then maybe, maybe I'll be able to get that from them. You think that's, that's that what's the new term for that kind of self-centered manipulation? It's called networking. Right? <laughs> it's so much a part of our culture. And so that forces us to come to Jesus exactly as we are. Because what the scriptures do is that they hold up this mirror that we don't actually want to see. It is possible, by the way, to sort of roll through the service and act like none of this stuff is actually being talked about when the lessons are read and leave and take communion and go home and feel really good about yourself because you did your, social, your religious obligation this morning and you got to see some people that you really like. But if that's what you're here for, you shouldn't be listening to the sermon because God is after something a lot deeper than that. What God is after is your heart. And not the heart, the nice heart that you want to show him, the real heart. That's sometimes filled with joy, sometimes is filled with things that are full of shame, sometimes that knows real peace and laughter, and other times it's just despair. Sometimes we can actually nice and we're nice and we mean it, and we're not after anything, we're just doing it. And then other times we're just angry. Right? Nod your head, see? I mean, I mean, you're dead in the water even at the beginning of the service when you pray, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and all desires are open. There you are. God knows it all. But what the scripture says, and this is where you go to Galatians, is that there's something more at work in us than the divided heart that we so quickly feel. And it is the very presence of the Spirit of God. That God has claimed us as his own. He knows everything about who we are. None of this is a surprise to him in the slightest. So even though you're trying to put your best foot forward and look good to other people, God is not so easily convinced by the charade. Instead, he sees what's really in us. And does he judge us for it? No, no. You see, the judgment was paid on the cross of Christ. He's received us and accepted us. And not merely sort of accepting us so you can do whatever you want. Nope, that's not what the scripture says. Instead, what he does is that he accepts us and begins to plant in us something that is entirely new. And what that newness is, is the presence of his spirit that has the capacity, that has the power, that even has the job description to begin to work something new inside of us so that what in fact does begin to emerge are the things that are called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, all of which describe the very character of Jesus because it is the job description of the Holy Spirit to work in us, not the character that we've got, not even the character that we've developed by very proper training, but instead, the character of Christ that is far beyond mere courtesy. It's deeper than that. It's genuine compassion. It is generosity, not just leftovers. It is a willingness to forgive, to let go of resentment, 
rather than just being nice and still keeping it all down inside. You see, I'm, that's what I need Jesus for. I know how to be nice. I don't need Jesus to help me be nice. But I need Jesus to change my heart so I understand what real love is, what real compassion is, what real kindness is, and the very things that are the fruit of the Spirit. Because you see, the fruit of the Spirit is not my best effort to change myself. Instead, it's the fruit of God at work in our lives. And so what do we do? We come here, and we know that God knows all of who we are, even, even if nobody else does. And he sees the inner life and the outer life and the fact that they're different. I mean, that's a part of what it means to be civilized, is for the outward life to look a little better. But he wants more than being civilized. He wants a changed life. And that's what he's after. So we can come today and be honest before God, about what's really inside of us and lay all of who we are before Him, knowing that when we lay all of who we are before Him, He doesn't run away, He doesn't judge, He doesn't do anything except take us as we are and begin to strengthen the good work of what He has put inside of us. So are we changed overnight? Well, you know, actually it occasionally happens. You know, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I mean, real conversions just like that do take place. But what's more true for most of us is that we are challenged to say yes to Jesus again and again so that the change becomes more gradual. And so we pray, Lord, okay, today, left to my own devices, I know what I'm like. But God, I want to be yours today. So today, don't even think about tomorrow. Today, help me to be generous. Help me to be kind. Help me to look for an opportunity to serve someone else. I get through the day. And I sort of think about, okay, what's the batting average? Did I do okay? Well, most of the time, but then I got nervous and I was afraid of what someone would think of me. So I wasn't as brave as I could have been. I, I, I need some help with that. And so you begin to enter into, in fact, a kind of cooperative relationship with God where you continue to be honest with Him and you continue to give Him your heart and you begin to see, and I'm, re I'm ready to testify about that, you begin to see real change begin to happen. The work of God's work in you. <coughs> now, that's really what confirmation is. Which is why when they stand up and make the promises, what are they going to say? They won't say, oh, I will. No. They more realistically say, I will with God's help. Because we know what's inside. I need God's help to fulfill these things. There's a kind of dignified humility about it all. Because, as the scripture says, we know whereof we are made. So I would invite you as we enter into the rest of the service, as you make commitments to Christ and to them in the service, as we come to receive communion, please do not be superficial. <clears throat> Allow the real you to be present in this service and offer who you really are to God. Because, as I love saying, if you're real with God, He will be real with with you. And that's when true change happens. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are so gracious, that you put up with so much from us, and yet you love us deeply. You know all of who we are, and we are yours. So even today, open our hearts to your courage and to your grace that we may continue to say yes to you, honestly and realistically, confessing that we do need your help, but we do want to work in us that which you desire. So we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.